There was a point about two weeks ago when Nathan asked me to preach where I said, I could do two things at the same time. And my wife reminded me there's no such thing as multitasking. Uh, I have to say it, she's really right. Happy birthday. Yeah, th thanks for that. Yeah, that's, this, this is my present. Doing two things at once. So I'm just moving one headspace to another headspace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word and we thank you for everything that it contains. We thank you that they are the very words of life. And Holy Spirit, I pray this morning that we would hear very little from me and a whole lot from you. We thank you for the history of the scriptures and the comfort that it brings us, the challenges that it brings us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's see if I'll get this right. Whoa, here we go. Yeah. Today's about the S and the R word. Yeah, I thought that would get your attention. That was really to see if everyone's awake. What is, we're in Romans, what is the S word? No, we're still in the beginning. The word, yeah, who likes to say sin? You go in the workplace and you use the word sin, it's not very popular, is it? So we're in Romans, what might the R word be? Oh, I like that. We're going to go for a few R words. We're going to not stick with righteousness as where I was going, but we're going to stick with... Okay. I'm going in the right direction. Or am I? Yeah, one more. Okay. Whoa, now I'm being too fast, aren't I, Justin? That's right. I'm going to read something from Romans chapter 3, verse 21. And uh, it's a good reminder that this letter was sent as a letter. We, we, we read it and we break it up into little bits and pieces. But if the leading pastors decided to preach on the whole thing, it might be bring your lunch and a sleeping bag because for us. But remember, it was a letter that was written. And so we, we break it up into lots of little bits. But that's where we are. So this is what we're going to look at a bit today. And this is from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through to 31. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because his forbearance, in his forbearance he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be the just one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is the boasting? It's excluded. Because of what? The law that requires works. No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is the God of God the God of or is God the God of the Jews only? He is not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith, we do then nullify the law by this faith. Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. And you're going, where are we going with all of this? Paul wrote Romans. 
and some of the theologically trained here might say there is dispute over that. But in the main, people accept that Paul wrote the book of Romans. The first bit of Romans that we read is quite in your face about the S word, about sin. But I always thought it's a really good idea to remind us a little bit about Paul. Paul was a man that was seemingly righteous. Paul was a man above others in worshipping the God as he knew it. But this is the same Paul who was there at the first martyring of Stephen. And those that martyred and killed Stephen put their cloaks at the feet of Paul, which more than likely would suggest that he was the authoritative one there that was saying it is legal for this man to be stoned. This is Paul. Paul was a really, in his own mind and in the eyes of faith, a righteous man. He actually thought that those that followed after Jesus, people of the way, were absolutely wrong. And he was passionate about it. Let's not make mistake, Paul was passionate in his dislike, actually of his hate, because he saw it as heresy. So he goes to the high priest, gets letters to say, I'm going down to Damascus now, I need some letters, and I don't care if it's men or women or children, what have you, the people of the way, I'm going to shut this down. So this is the Paul who wrote some of the stuff we're looking at over the last few weeks. And all of us who know the story from Sunday school is one of my favourites because we got to dra dramatise it. Isn't it amazing what you can learn in Sunday school? Which was a few years ago. <laughs> but we still remember those kind of things that helped us remember. So Paul's on the way down and he gets struck by light. Whether he was on a horse, a donkey or walking, he collapsed and was confronted. And now I remember I left my phone over here for something that I needed. Thank you. Don't message me anyone. <laughs> you. So Paul is going down to Damascus. He's been confronted. And this is the same super religious Paul. And these are Paul's gone down and he's spitting out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So he's got letters to go to the synagogues in Damascus and says if he can find any men or women, he might take them prisoners to Jerusalem. But as he neared Damascus, a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard some words. And these are words that changed Paul's life forever. These are the words he heard. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And what was the answer? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So just imagine what's happening in Paul's head. He's been thinking he's been doing the right thing and all of a sudden now he's confronted with a voice from God that says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. And he was struck blind. I actually think it was really good that he was struck blind because I think he would have been going through this theological weird thing going on in his head because everything he had ever known had changed because what he just discovered is, and this is the essence of Paul's gospel, Jesus is Lord. It changed everything for him. His whole theology was changed because what he thought to be true was completely, he missed the point. For Paul... Jesus is Lord, changed everything. The first chapter of Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart by the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus our Lord. Everything changed for Paul. 
I find it completely and utterly stunning for what must have been going on. And we know for Thomas, who know our scriptures, Paul then that went off for a time. I think it was to try and get his head set around that everything what he thought was true was not true. Because if we read this carefully, it says the gospel promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul was a scholar. Paul knew the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and to suddenly be introduced that this Jesus that he was thought was a troublemaker was Lord. I'm just, the internal conflict must have been absolutely radical in his brain. The question of what does it take to make someone right with God? What does it take to be in a right relationship with God? What does it take to be in a place where we can be, we know when we pass from this life to the next, in the right place? This is not a question of religions today, but it is, but it actually goes back so far. So far, it's a question that Job asked. And Job, if you know your stories, was a man that knew God, knew and was tested. And I'm just going to read a little bit here. Indeed, I know that this is true. How can a mere mortal, how can mere men prove their innocence before God? Though they wished to dispute with him, they couldn't answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom, that is God's wisdom, is profound and his power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it. He overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the seas. He is the maker of the bear and Orion and Pleiades and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. If he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? God does not restrain his anger. Even the cohorts of Rahab cowered at his feet. How then can I dispute with him? How can I find words to argue with him? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. So the question that Paul had and the question that's been there all the way back from Job was how can a person be right with God when I read that passage in Job I found it the kind of God we're dealing with is not I did toy with the idea of getting an older person up here grandfatherly like kind of person and thought I'm a grandfather I don't really feel like a grandfather but we have sometimes this idea of God being this gentle soft kind of easy go lucky person when the God that Job talked about is, is God that we have to deal with. We don't get to choose what God is like. And this is what Paul was wrestling with as he was trying to understand it is, how can someone be right with God? God is not, you get to answer this, God is not the shape I want him to be. Does anyone else feel like God is not the shape? This requires a bit of, we're going to stay here until we get some. Who... Who here thinks that God is not the shape that you want him to be? We've got not, that's about as we're going to get with nods. I think we've got to do something. That old question earlier, we are talking about um, how you start church. Is there a Pentecostal way of starting church? And someone said, it's more of a Baptocostal way of starting church. But if I get a nod head here, I think that's, the, we're going over the top. So you guys <laughs> calm down with the, the head nodding stuff because that's just, it's just getting all too wild. Last week, we finished our sermon. I've got to say uh, that I enjoyed our sermon. Sorry, the week before. I remember that we had the kids last week. It wasn't that great. It was. It was so good. Only problem is they didn't put their couch back. We got here this morning. The couch was here and saying, the kids didn't clean up. <laughs> yeah, that's, 
I thought that was good. I thought Men's Shed would have done that, David. What's going on? No. In Romans chapter 3, remember the first part of Romans we've been hearing about, we've got Paul talking about the problem of sin. It's a big problem. But we've got down to Romans chapter 3 where we left off with Jess. And that was, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. I sometimes wonder that's why we need to, when we read some scriptures, we need to almost have read it as a letter form. And I encourage you in your small groups, these are the kind of things to talk through, to work through, because there's so much meat no matter where you go with this whole book of Romans. Justification is the total opposite of condemnation. Now, we're going to practice Pentecostalism, okay? So I was trying to work out on the screen, I make but now go, but shows you I'm technologically challenged. But there's this incredible thing that happens at chapter at, in chapter 3 at verse 21. We've talked about all the negativity of sin and all this problem that you can't be right with God. And then it says, but now. So we're going to try that again. But now. But, but now. Uh, seriously, guys. <laughs> Who... Who cheers when they go to the football? Come on, let's come on, let's go through this year. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Okay, for all those who actually know how to make a noise. But now. Yay! Now we're talking. Because it actually all starts to change. But now. But now, apart from the law, our righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. That's what Paul was talking about. So for, for Paul, his whole thinking changed because he knew all the old stuff. His problem was he discovered that Jesus is Lord. And that's when he started to scratch his head and going, how do I make sense of all of this? But justification is the opposite of condemnation. And the first two words, but now, signals an incredible change in the letter to the Romans. It turns from condemnation because, let's face it, you read the first chapter of Romans and you wonder where you're left standing. The first time the word justification or justified in Romans is found in verse 24. Being justified as a gift by God's grace. To this point, everything in this letter, the believers in Rome were getting warmed up for a preparation for the extraordinary teaching that Paul was bringing about justification by faith. Paul's argument about we are hopeless and sin is a major big problem. Sin's not a vastly popular thing to talk about, to say, come next week, we're going to talk about sin. <laughs> Do the numbers go down or the numbers go up? I don't know. I think I've said it from this pulpit before, but... Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I do not need convincing of that. And I do not mean because of the horrific things that we've seen recently. I mean all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the point that Paul is trying to make here is that to be right with God, to be justified, is apart from the law. It doesn't come down to law-keeping. But now, apart from the law of righteousness, God has made known. And he announces that this righteousness that we desperately need cannot come by our attempts to keep the law. The righteousness of God means the righteousness that God requires. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul goes on a bit about it. He talks about, I did this, I did this, and I was so good. Not only did he keep all the commandments... He kept the extra 613, or is it 614, I'm really... Of all the other stuff, to make sure. And he says, according to the law, faultless. According to the possible obedience of the law, he said he was faultless. But now he writes, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
Righteousness not, cannot come by achieving or keeping the Ten Commandments. There is no way by our own efforts that we can meet God's high standard, the high standard that God requires if we want to make it to heaven. What God requires is absolute perfection. God has established the standard of his own perfect holiness and he's not going to lower it one bit. This is a tough teaching. It's kind of good news and bad news. Paul's got the bad news out, but the bad news and the good news actually work together. There is no way by our own efforts that we can meet the high mark that God requires. God requires absolute perfection. And I don't know about you, but I am so far away from that. I was about to say it's embarrassing. But I'm so far away from it, I'm, it's embarrassing. At the end of verse 23, when Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the standard measurement is the glory of God, which is the moral perfection of God. God's own holy character. You're not going to be measured against the morality of other people. You are not going to say, I'm better than that person that's sitting next to me. Ooh. I'm pretty good. I was trying to work this out last night, but I think 43 or 44 years ago, and for some of you who haven't lived that long, think, well, that's a long time, man. You'll be old one day, Derek, by the way. One day you'll be old. Yeah, yeah. This is just for you, Derek. I wondered what happens when in heaven, how old are you in heaven? So if I died at 90 and you died at 85, or who's going to be the old one? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, dear. I like consistency. That's what I really, really like. We are not going to be measured by the morality of other people. But about 42, 43 years ago, I heard a song called Don't Shoot the Wounded, One Day You Might Be One, which the more you think about it is be careful about who you're being rude to because you might find yourself in that circumstance. But there is another line in the song, and that's what I want to not sing but to tell you about. And this other line is that we make judgment about other people's sin and their life when it exceeds our own. I would never do that. Oh, I'm so much better than that. Maybe we don't say the words out loud, but we make judgment about what is sinful according to our own measure to say, I wouldn't do that. We are not going to be measured against our own expectations for ourselves. We can never achieve the righteousness that God requires us to keep. How can a man know God? How can a person know God? In Ephesians 2 8, we know that for grace you have been saved through faith and it's not of yourself. We make no contribution to our own salvation other than our sin that was laid upon Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross justification is all apart and it's a righteousness that come it's got nothing to do with the law the law makes us become aware of it justification is also Paul discovered is in the Old Testament it's witnessed by the Old Testament prophets. Paul goes on to saying, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, and he is making a statement that says the entire Old Testament throughout it, and we could be here all day, this would be a great Bible study to say, the occasions where we remember God's faithfulness and people's faithfulness and all this language and talk and experience that speaks forward to what we're talking about, the righteousness of God in Christ. Paul says that the whole Old Testament bears witness to the righteousness of God and that's what is, we find in the gospel. Paul wants us to know this is not a new message. The Old Testament is not an old one and we've gone for the new one. 
It's not like old car, new car. It's not old and new. It's actually the Old Testament is just old by nature, but it is all not irrelevant anymore. That's Paul's problem. Paul, in the world in which he was, discovered that Jesus is Lord, which made him rethink everything. And he was going back in his brain over all his years of study to work out what had been happening. Paul made this announcement at the very onset of Romans. He told us in the second verse of the book that the gospel was witnessed by the prophets and recorded in the Old Testament scriptures a long time ago. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul writes, The gospel, Jesus is Lord, was promised beforehand in this Holy Scriptures. And Paul declares that this gospel was the righteousness that was, right, was required clearly, not a new thing, but something that was evident in the Old Testament. And it would be fun if we had all day and a bit to go back and look at those scriptures. Some of you are thinking about Abraham. Some of you are thinking about others that were counted righteous. What is for absolute certain is that God is the source and the giver of righteousness. And the righteousness that God requires is the righteousness that he gives. I don't have a problem with all of sin and fall on the shield of the glory of God. I know that I need the righteousness of God. Which is a really good thing because there's no other way. And Paul is so clear in his argument. And where we go in Romans next is, gets really exciting. Because we get to talk about people's favourite verses. Which is really true and great. But it only makes sense if we actually get the real full understanding of the beginning to know that sin is a big problem and being righteous in your own sight, it ain't going to happen. doesn't matter what I do. This whole idea of, you know, the pick yourself up by the bootstraps, you just simply can't do it. Yet Paul, who considered himself and others considered him to be faultless, was still considered needing the righteousness of Christ. God is the source of the righteousness that he demands. When we saw the verse from Joel, he talks about this incredibly big God, this powerful God, who even though he passed me, I wouldn't know him. Yet it was a God who could do absolutely amazing things. But the righteousness that we need does not come from within us. Sitting under a tree, contemplating in navel or something, or some other methodology. But the righteousness that we need does not come from us. But it comes from outside of ourself. And it actually comes from outside of the church and outside of this world. It's a righteousness that comes down from the throne of God. Going to church doesn't make you righteous. Going to church doesn't make you righteous, does it? That's better. We're just checking you awake because we've still got a bit more to go here. The only way to exercise righteousness in our life is by having faith in God's Son. The dramatic change that went over Paul, he knew all this stuff. He knew all this Old Testament stuff that scholars today would say, that's fantastic, great understanding. He just didn't understand the essential thing that says, Jesus is Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, that changes everything. It changes everything, not just for Paul, it changes it for me. Because if Jesus is Lord, is he, if he is who he said he was, it means an incredible difference in the way that I live my life. Faith is only as good as its object and it is only faith in Jesus Christ and that he gives to us the righteousness of God. If you put your faith in anything or in anyone else, it doesn't work. Righteousness only comes from one place. God will only deal with us on the basis of faith in his son. 
Yeah, okay. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. I think it's a really important fact for us to understand this really, really simple verse. For it's with the heart that you believe, because for some of us, we may have been coming to church for most of our life, maybe all of our life. But it's with your heart that you believe and are justified and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. So how does a person know God? How does a person know God? Thank you. In who? In Jesus. Okay, we're going to do that again. All the port and crow, you know next week when you guys practice... We practice that whole cheering thing, even in front of the TV. So we can try that again. Faith in who? Jesus. Seriously. You know when, they, when players sometimes are looking at the crowd and they're going like this? They're trying to get the crowd involved in the game? Port do that a bit because they really need some help there. <laughs> Faith in who? Jesus. That's now we're getting better there. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. something that we're going to do a little bit different we're going to have a sing prayer so the team's going to come and um, the song we're going to sing is a song we've sung before but I want it to be sung as a prayer not sung as something that's just a song in the words I want you to personalize the words to sing it literally as your prayer because it speaks about the righteousness of God because without it I'm shot I'm gone. I need the righteousness of Christ. And I do it by faith in Jesus Christ. For some of you, even hearing some of what we're talking about this morning and the feeling of sinfulness, and I, I still don't get this, and maybe there's a point where you're thinking, I don't even know if I'm in a right relationship with God. If you want to pray or talk about it after church, I'm going to be over this way and Aaron may join me and others. But it's a really good thing for us when we're praying words. And for those of you who, when you sing in church, you do this. Not today. This song is a song prayer that you need to sing with your heart. Just give me a moment to transition. <laughs> Joy, my righteousness and freedom. 